Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. On, on work, uh, John and his, his colleague Paul Rowe um, from Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Um, the title of the talk is uh, Garden Point Generics and, and Implementation Issues. Uh, John has been working on programming language compilers uh, for about 20 years, and during the 1990s, his Modula 2 compilers were the best known implementations of the language on uh, all major, major computer architectures. His work on reverse compilation is also well known. In the last few years, John has worked on compilers for managed frameworks and has written two CLR compilers and is the author of the book Compiling for the .NET Common Language Runtime, which I think many of you are familiar with. Um, until recently, um, John was the Dean of the Faculty of Information Technology at Queensland University of Technology in Australia. Um, and so this is the first of two talks. This one focuses on the work uh, done with Paul Rowe. John. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, as uh, Mark said, this is the, the first of uh, two talks, uh, and uh, it's work uh, done with my colleague Paul Ryan and involves some other uh, people as well. Uh, so, oh, I found which mouse to use. Okay, an, an overview of the talk. Um, I, I want to talk about the first of the or, or original objectives of the project, uh, a little bit of background, uh, and uh, some of the outcomes, and finally uh, s the future work. Um, it was originally intended uh, that we would do uh, two or three things as part of this project. Uh, one of them was to um, it, to do a generic extension to the component Pascal language, which was the the kind of running example in my uh, book. And uh, so there are two aspects to this. One of them was uh, the issue of how one would go about adding generics to a language which uh, doesn't uh, currently have them. And the second part was the issues of implementation of generics uh, on the CLR. And uh, what I had in mind there was the issue that uh, generics is a new uh, capability being added to the CLI so that it was uh, important, I thought, that uh, it should be, ex be able to be explained at about the same level of detail as uh, was in my uh, book on the non-generic aspects of the language. So uh, both of those issues were important, the issue of how to add generics to a language and what problems that might uh, cause. And secondly, um, how to how to go about the actual implementation, uh, and we also uh, wanted to upgrade our tools uh, so that the tool set dealt with all the uh, new uh, metadata. Um, okay, so uh, one of the uh, first things we Oh, I, I should say something about uh, component uh, Pascal. Uh, GPCP is uh, an object-oriented uh, Pascal dialect. Uh, the original author uh, of the, the designer of the language is Clement Schapersky, who uh, works here in Redmond uh, and is the, uh, the author of the famous uh, book on component technology, which uh, many of you will know. Uh, it's a type-safe language in the same uh, sense as C-sharp is if you don't mention the word unsafe. And so every legal component Pascal program is verifiable. Uh, and it turns out that it's slightly more abstract than C-sharp, uh, which is uh, something I'll refer to again in a minute. 
Uh, it's more abstract in the sense that uh, when you declare data types, when you declare the type, you uh, are effectively uh, demanding that they have particular semantics for, uh, for assignment and also that they have particular uh, semantics in terms of object creation. And the issue of whether or not the underlying representation has value or reference semantics is completely unknown. The people who use the language have no idea. You just say, here's this thing, it's a record. That means that when you do uh, an assignment on it, you get value semantics rather than alias semantics. Uh, but you don't know whether it's going to be represented at runtime by reference or not. So that's sometimes an issue. Well, as far as the uh, generic questions of uh, implementing generics on a uh, compiled system. Uh, if you wish to do it in a, uh, a way that is verifiable, there are three options available to you. You can uh, treat the, the definition of the type as being some kind of macro definition and have the compiler front end expand it uh, uh, for each instantiating uh, type argument. Uh, and that's essentially the the, the kind of naive method that simple C++ compilers use for templates. Uh, you can use a uniform representation for all values by uh, effectively uh, treating everything as object so that you erase all type information and then when it matters at the point of use of objects you cast them back to their statically known type. Uh, and finally you have the option which uh, the, uh, which is the one which is now available on uh, generic implementations, the CLI, which is to leave the types open within the intermediate form and allow the JIT to specialise uh, the, the implementation. Now the, the differences between those uh, particular strategies are that uh, if, you, if you treat uh, generic uh, type definitions as just macros and expand them in the front end, then you get this bloat of code because you end up with multiple uh, implementations or multiple definitions in the intermediate form of the types. Now the thing that's uh, tantalizing about it of course is that uh, for uh, most code, for all of the um, all reference types, you can share precisely the same code because you're just copying four byte or eight byte pointers around and uh, so you would like to get rid of the code bloat by sharing. Unfortunately, you can't, sh the front end cannot do the sharing because if you attempt to share by saying, well, all reference types will use the same uh, IL, then uh, you'll fail verification because the uh, operands in the IL are typed and uh, you are uh, trying to treat them uniformly. So, uh, so if you want to share code then you can go to my number two on the slide here by using the uniform representation as object then you can share the code but you end up with these typecasts everywhere, uh, which is bizarre because you statically know that these typecasts cannot fail, right? Because your static analysis shows that these casts will always succeed, but uh, the JIT uh, will um, will uh, dutifully uh, perform the operation that you uh, have asked for uh, at some considerable expense. And the third option, of course, is the one which is the real innovation and the thing that makes the difference between the support that the CLI now gives to, uh, to generics and uh, what is available on the Java virtual machine where you have to use uh, method two. Well, the first thing that I did was I wanted to just explore how bad uh, this uh, particular overhead was 
of uh, dealing with uh, casting and uh, boxing and unboxing. So I did two uh, separate implementation of generic vectors. Now, let me digress for a minute or so to talk about the vector types because they're my favorite data structure. Uh, it turns out that if you uh, want to do list operations in, where you simply add onto the end of a list, you do append, and then you, you want to uh, then access the members of the list uh, in an indexed way, then, uh, or even if you just want to traverse them in order, uh, that uh, very ex extensible arrays which are allocated by a mortised doubling so that every time you need more you just double the size. Uh, these always outperform linked lists. So almost every classical implementation, every classical algorithm which uses linked lists is done better by using extensible arrays. And you've got random access as well by indexing. Uh, it turns out that they, in spite of the fact that uh, the arrays, uh, up to half of the array is, is empty at any one time, uh, they still take up less space than a linked list and uh, they uh, are faster and, and give you these extra operations. They also have better cache behaviour, which is uh, not insignificant. Anyway, I, as I say, I digress. This is my uh, favourite uh, data structure. When I discovered it quite some years ago, I completely rewrote my then current compiler. So, you, for example, in my modular 2 compilers, you won't find a single linked list. Everything you do in a compiler uh, where you would normally use a list, you can use uh, one of these things anyway. So, I implemented uh, these uh, lists as a built into the compiler using two different uh, techniques the type erasure technique where everything has to be boxed and a direct technique where uh, which is exactly what you would get either by uh, using the JIT to specialize on the uh, unchecked side of IL or to use uh, compiler front end specialization. Here are some figures uh, which is uh, just a, a single example where I, uh, the two implementations were for IEEE double elements uh, and uh, I, uh, because these things as the lists get longer you get more and more expensive copying operations so I uh, took, measured the time that it took to create a list of 100,000 elements by the two different methods and just for comparison I looked at uh, a singly linked list of doubles with a next pointer. You'll see that, uh, and this is just on a kind of middle range PC, that's the number of nanoseconds for average append. You'll see that the uh, non-type raised version, which is in the middle, is, is a lot faster. And uh, the extra time that it takes for the boxed one is the time that you, you take for uh, actually boxing the element uh, and uh, so and, and compared to the uh, singly linked list the cost there the overhead is that of object creation for the linked list objects. If you have a look at the uh, average time to access a randomly chosen element I built uh, one of these uh, lists with a hundred thousand elements and then I did, uh, uh, I don't know, it was either a million or ten million uh, random uh, accesses to various things. You will see that the, uh, that the cost uh, for the boxed case, uh, the extra cost there is the cost of the typecast. Okay, so uh, it's not a huge amount but it's uh, still a significant uh, difference both for access and for list creation. <clears throat> okay well there is another possibility of course and uh, when I, I did a, a CLR 
back end for my old uh, Modular 2 compilers, which I hadn't done any work on for about 10 years, but I pulled it out, blew the dust off, and wrote a CLR back end simply because I wanted to learn about uh, producing unverified code, which was something I didn't deal with very much in the book. And it turned out to be, uh, it was an interesting exercise, because producing unverified code just using uh, uh, raw pointers and, and unmanaged uh, data types in the, um, uh, in the framework it introduced new issues that I hadn't thought of. So, but uh, that compiler has had um, uh, these vector types built in since since the early 90s, uh, but of course the implementation, being a native code compiler originally, the the uh, implementation is in terms of block copies and and just uh, you, you know you you malloc as much space as you need and and you just simply lay things out in the in the flat address space. Uh, well, that's that's very efficient, of course. Uh, but of course it's totally unverified because you're just uh, doing address arithmetic and so on. All right, well, I, uh, as a first step, I built these vector types into the component Pascal compiler. Uh, and uh, I did two different implementations because I want this to retrofit on, on the 1.1 uh, framework as well as on Whidbey. On the 1.1 framework, I did a mixed implementation where I did specialization by the front end for the primitive types. And that's easy because you do it offline. It's built into the, the runtime system because there's a finite number of them. You know how many there are. You just compile it ahead of time. Uh, and for uh, the re reference types on the 1.1 framework, it uh, uses type erasure. And in the case of value types, it uses boxing and type erasure. Version 2, it uses generics. Well, there's a number of issues that cropped up uh, immediately when we did this work. And one of them is that uh, this thing that I referred to earlier about the level of abstraction in, in component Pascal, so that one of the uh, possibilities that you have on the Whidbey generics is to say that to constrain a particular uh, generic type so that one of the type arguments has to be anything you like but it has to be a reference type or anything you like but it has to be a value type. And since the user of a, a component, uh, past, these are not meaningful uh, ideas uh, so far as the uh, component Pascal programmer is concerned. So that's um, a, a bit of an issue uh, which uh, doesn't turn out to be much of a problem in practice but it, theoretically it's an issue. Uh, and there's also a question about return values. Uh, component Pascal uh, doesn't, uh, can't return either structs or arrays uh, or well, it can, but the language says you can't. Um, it, the compiler's perfectly capable of doing it, but you have to do a non-standard switch. OK, so let's talk about some of the, the paperwork that we generated as part of the project. I, some time ago, finished the first of two uh, papers on, the, uh, on generics. And uh, the first part I've called Understanding Generics on the CLR. And it sets out to explore implementation issues without talking about the type theory. I wanted to talk about uh, generics from the point of view of how you push the bits around rather than what it means in terms of programming language type theory. Um, and uh, the second part, which has to do with the implementation, uh, the issues for implementation, uh, is still in preparation. Originally, all of this material was intended to be uh, part of a second edition of the book, but it appears that uh, a second edition is still some time away, so the material will all 
uh, is already available or will be available uh, uh, on the web. Uh, there's a paper also, uh, the, the next thing that we did was uh, some work on a series of toy languages in order to explore uh, implementation issues. Uh, we did a sequence of toy languages which we call Mini Computer Pascal uh, and um, uh, these are, uh, that works complete and it's available uh, together with online versions of the compiler so which means you can uh, sort of lob into the web page, submit a program and press go and get back uh, an XE or DLL to, or an IL file. And uh, finally, the uh, documentation finally for the per WAPI tools now available and talks a bit about the generics. Uh, and in fact, I'll be saying more about that uh, next uh, tomorrow in the other talk. Uh, well, the, the uh, particular family of languages uh, is represented by roughly by this uh, uh, Venn diagram. Uh, none of the languages, um, it, it, the, the, the component Pascal language was, was fairly uh, savagely subsetted uh, so as to make the, the implementation task a, a little simpler, which is, uh, was important since we were going to do about five different uh, compilers here. Uh, and uh, several of them uh, really go outside the standard uh, component Pascal specification. Uh, as well as implementing the compiler, the person who did the work here, who's a guy called Brian Blackwell, um, actually did formal uh, type rules for each of these languages, which are a sequence of increasing uh, complexity. And so the, uh, the specifications, uh, again, build on each other. So for those of you who, who uh, like to read stuff like what you see on the slide here, I can certainly encourage you to go and look. There's pages and pages of this stuff. And the way that the implementation of the type checker is done is based very much on this, uh, directly on, on these uh, uh, type rules. Uh, and the, the web access is really nice because when you uh, if you move your mouse over any of these rules, there's a little pop-up box, one of which you can see there on the screenshot, uh, which actually gives you information about the rule. So it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, type theory meets uh, modern eye candy. Okay, well, uh, the, these languages, this functional uh, mini component Pascal, which is a kind of functional subset of component Pascal. There's the imperative language, which is uh, a subset of the standard component Pascal language. There's one with uh, interfaces as well, which of course is part of the Garden's point implementation of component Pascal. And finally, there's uh, the case, uh, the language with generics. Well, <clears throat> okay, all of, the, all of these languages were implemented. The compilers are uh, both uh, available to play with, but also online. Uh, and uh, Significantly, when you're dealing with any of these, you can produce output either for, uh, for uh, version 1.1 of the, of the standard .NET framework or version 2.0. Uh, and the semantics in the generic case are, are, s are limited slightly so that it's possible to do uh, either uh, the, all of the generics, either on the 1.1 framework using type erasure or uh, the 2.0 using the full uh, would-be um, uh, instruction set. Uh, and the generics compiler uses a, uh, an implementation of uh, Luca Cardelli's uh, type inference, which was written by a previous student of ours called uh, Simeon Cran. So, uh, Simeon Cran did a complete implementation of Cardelli's uh, uh, type inferencer, uh, and which was sort of incomplete. It was just sort of the main algorithm. Simeon did the whole darn thing, 
and uh, then um, uh, Brian grabbed it and incorporated it into the into the heart of uh, the generic case. Now here's some IL output from one of the test cases. If you if you lob into the online compiler and you decide that it's too much problem to uh, type a program into the text box, uh, there's a number of uh, example programs you can use, uh, and one of them is the infamous Garcia test, which is a, a little toy program which uh, is deliberately designed to, um, to make it difficult for type erasure type implementations. You have to, uh, pr it's a case where you have to produce wrapper functions to, to make the type erasure work. Now this is the case, in, in, and I had to edit it down to fit on a page, but here's one of the procedures. This is the case where I ticked the box to get uh, V2.0 output. As you can see by uh, all of the, the lovely um, uh, bang in um, um, notations there and you notice the use of the constrained prefix sort of halfway down. Now here's precisely the same, uh, the IL uh, of the same method as it appears with uh, version 1.1 and you will notice there that there's a class, uh, cast class instruction uh, in the place where constrained appeared in the previous example. So, uh, it, but both of these uh, uh, run identically. All right, <clears throat> moving on to talk about uh, uh, some of the tool work. Um, Diane Corney's per WAPI uh, tool is a P reader writer, uh, and uh, Diane extended it to deal with all of the um, metadata for generics. Uh, it has actually been downloaded and, and used by quite a number of people, but it's, uh, it was pretty buggy, uh, and I started using it to, um, to do two things. One of them was to back end our compilers uh, so as to write out, uh, to, to use this uh, to produce P files uh, directly, and the other uh, was to uh, uh, do this PE file browser. One of the uh, uh, traditions of the Pascal family languages is that they've always used metadata to, uh, to do separate compilation. Uh, and these are normally in the form of uh, binary symbol files, uh, which have information uh, corresponding to uh, to the, the metadata in a PE file, but there's extra stuff as well because there are uh, some uh, important features of the type system in Pascal style languages which uh, uh, cannot be represented on, on PE files except by using uh, custom attributes, which is something that we will still get around to doing at some stage. Okay, so if you want to access the uh, all of those riches of the uh, .NET libraries, uh, then you have to somehow take a PE file and convert it into a, uh, the format of a symbol file. And as well, that solves the compiler's problem. But as far as solving the uh, programmer's problem, it's, it's necessary to produce this in, a, in an HTML form, which is, is kind of readable, so that you can see not what it looks like in C Sharp, but what it looks like in component Pascal. So uh, per WAPI got upgraded, uh, and I did these two tasks, was that one of them uh, making the uh, compiler uh, backend use it, and, and also to do this tool. And uh, it, along the way, I uh, fixed a fairly large number of issues, because per WAPI is a big uh, program, and you can guarantee that everything that hasn't been tested will be broken. So it's, uh, but it's now in a, a much better state, and uh, the P file browser is can uh, correctly read the whole of MS Corelib, which is, if you like, the the ultimate uh, sanity test because 
uh, if it's not in MS CoreLib, then uh, you, you probably won't find it anywhere else either, and, and also the compiler bootstraps. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, one of the MS CoreLib uh, um, namespaces looks like as rendered by our browse tool. Uh, you see it looks like uh, component Pascal. Uh, and uh, I've chosen the option here where we keep the tick n form of the names uh, just for, for purposes of uh, kind of debugging things. There's a couple of things that you really need to, to notice here. Um, one of them is that uh, instance methods are separated from static methods in, in this language so that you, you have a, uh, the possibility of formatting all of the related methods with the same name in one place in the file rather than each of them being tucked away inside the separate class definitions. Uh, and uh, if we, you click on one of the hyperlinks here to get all the type bound procedures, that's the instance methods for a particular type. I did this for compara, and you see that uh, compara was an abstract, type, abstract class, and you notice that at the top of the page there we have all of the, the signatures of the, uh, um, the instance methods there. And oh, w one of the uh, tricky things uh, here was to uh, rebind the bang zeros and bang ones to uh, so that they have the names that you would expect in an ordinary text file. Um, okay, so talking about uh, future work, uh, the a generic version of the full compiler is uh, not yet released. The current uh, release is uh, still uh, uh, 1.3.2, which is um, um, and 1.4.0. We're still playing with. Uh, it's not quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, second chapter of the implementation notes should be available uh, at about the same time. Uh, per WAPI has been available for some time. It's uh, uh, being upgraded fairly rapidly and is now reasonably robust. Uh, and the next release will actually generate PDB files as well. Here are the URLs for all of those um, things that I mentioned along the way. The main generics page is there. That's uh, where you can uh, get uh, some of the documents and also uh, Brian Blackwell's uh, uh, wonderful uh, type rules uh, and also the online compiler uh, and um, per WAPI is available from its own page and of course GPCP is also available. And that's, uh, I will be talking a, a little more about per WAPI in a different context in my talk tomorrow. I've got some up on the documentation. Any questions? You mentioned that the web can generate a P directly without calling Isla uh, In the book, you noticed uh, that it was quite possible that uh, that didn't really give any speed up uh, when you tried that first time and they used some other APIs. But mm. Well, does, well that's this give a, does this give a speed up? Yes, and, and in fact I'll be showing some figures uh, to, tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I see Surge sitting there in the back, so I have to say I think ILASM is a, is a great tool and certainly it's, you know, it's so convenient that when you're developing a compiler, if you screw up, you can uh, get in with your text editor and, and hack on the, the .il file and see what you need to do to make it work. Uh, it's much harder if you're writing binary directly, but there is a speed up, uh, partly because the, the file writer is part of the same process, whereas you know, in, in your normal uh, system using ILASM, you've actually got to start a process for each of for, for each compilation. So, uh, uh, but basically, I, from memory, the, the figures are: uh, if you if you do a full GP make on all of the modules of, of the compiler, 
uh, on my little machine at home. But if you just write out the IL and do no more, 2.9 seconds. If you uh, write out all the IL files and run ILASM on each of them, it takes 7 seconds. And if you write the PE files directly, it takes 3.0 seconds. That's for about 50-something uh, modules. So roughly speaking, you can write out a PE file with per WAPI in about the same time as it takes you to write out the text file, which of course is much bigger. Right? So it, it could be I. IO bound, but it is it is faster. Um, whether or not it'll still be faster when we have to call through the uh, the uh, unmanaged uh, interface to write the PDD files is another question. But you know, I don't I haven't got measurements on that yet. Yeah. Uh, have you ever considered an opportunity to use Phoenix for your compiler? Absolutely. <laughs> but um, uh, at, at a time when Phoenix is available for people to use without um, NDAs and things like that, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the Phoenix project and I'm uh, hoping to uh, uh, write about it. So, um, Definitely in, in the future, one of the things I, I need to do is to do the obvious experiments 